Have you ever been snorkeling over a coral reef? I've been lucky enough to enjoy the opportunity to do so, and it's exhilarating. The coral reef is beautiful. Corals of all shapes and sizes create splashes of alien color. Sponges filter feed with their gasping reticulations. Large and medium-sized fish float lazily around, nipping at food. Sea cucumbers, urchins, and various crustaceans creep along the ground and in the crevices between the coral, and the whole thing thrums with the vibrancy of life. It really is a beautiful and a, a wonderful experience, but I also couldn't shake the thought of a moray eel coming out of some dark recess and sniping at me with its creepy reptilian face. But uh, that's a, that's a personal problem, that's unimportant. What I want to tell you about today is a new study into the ecological role of an often overlooked little inhabitant of the coral reef, the tiny, humble, cryptobenthic fish. Ever since Darwin's time, scientists struggled to understand how coral reefs could exist. After all, there are these hyperdense, biodiverse hotspots, often surrounded on most or all sides by huge expanses of flat, featureless, barren ocean floor, and open, empty water with little in the way of nutrients. The prevailing thought was that reefs, by nature of being so biodiverse, represented a tight concentration of ecological services that were hyper-efficient in their management and recycling of resources. If some reef animal poops, its poop will feed the scavengers and fungus and filter feeders. If a reef animal dies, its decaying corpse does the same, and everything gets recycled. But Simon Brandel, a coral reef ecologist at Simon Fraser University in Canada, wasn't fully convinced by this explanation and wanted to test the value of the small cryptobenthic fish. These tiny creatures are measured in millimeters, with a body weight around a tenth of a gram. In the animal kingdom, uh, at least in the ocean, they're the smallest vertebrates that exist. And they're also hugely diverse, with 3,000 known species of various shapes and colorations, and an estimated 1,000 species also exist, but are yet to be discovered or described. In the course of their experiments, including isolating selected reef sites across the world and measuring the density of cryptobenthic fish that live there, Mr. Brandle and his colleagues found that these little fish prefer to stay very close to the reef. Because they're so small, they often don't have the physiological or the energy capacity to swim over large distances of open water. Such a journey would not just be immensely difficult, it would also be immensely dangerous for them too, which is why they tend to stay closer to the protective geography of the coral reef. During the research phase of the experiments, the researchers analyzed earlier data on the lifespan and mortality of the cryptobenthic fish and found that they grow really fast, and they die pretty fast too. And at this rate of reproduction, aging, and dying, these cryptobenthic fish can pump out seven generations in a single year. This produces a huge number of offspring who live, maybe reproduce, and then die. And all of this biomass that they provide and bring to the coral reef accounts for about 60% of the total fish biomass that gets consumed here. Basically, as far as fish contributions to the reef go, these swarming masses of tiny cryptobenthic fish make up more than half of all of that biomass. Mr. Brandle said, quote, Cryptobenthics do one thing particularly well, getting eaten, unquote. Indeed, alive, these fish provide the raw food for larger predatory fish who will eat them. And when dead, they provide the dissolving biomass for scavengers, filter feeders, corals, and everything else to eat. Their capacity to die in huge numbers while outbreeding the death rate and sustaining the community with food plays a huge role in perpetuating the health and vitality of coral reefs. With this clearer understanding of coral reef ecology, scientists are wondering just how cryptobenthic fish might affect other marine ecosystems, like mangroves or seagrass meadows, and if other tiny organisms, like crabs or snails, 
might also have some kind of disproportionately large influence on their local ecology as well.